Hello, welcome back. Uh, this is another session of Wimba. We are beginning our look at the lymphatic system, which is going to take us into um, really a discussion about the immune system, uh, which is what we're dealing with in, in a sense. Uh, the immune system and the lymphatic system are uh, two systems that tend to be linked very often. And so over the next uh, about a week and a half or so, uh, in lecture, we will be looking at uh, exactly what the lymphatic system is, how it functions, what structures are associated uh, with the lymphatic system, uh, and exactly what is its role uh, or how does it support uh, the immune system within the body. And so uh, with that said, uh, why don't we go ahead and jump into this and uh, begin our journey into the lymphatic system. Uh, first thing that we need to make sure that we understand, uh, we have some key words uh, or uh, functions, I should say, of the lymphatic system. Uh, and they are, of course, first uh, and foremost, uh, fluid drainage. So any kind of excess fluid that may be associated within the um, uh, interstitial fluid, uh, or I should say from within the tissue, uh, that interstitial fluid will be drained out of that tissue and uh, disposed of typically through the lymphatic system. Uh, the other thing that the lymphatic system does uh, is, again, uh, immune detection. Uh, and so in other words, if uh, any kind of bacterial infections or viruses, uh, anything that does not belong, including transplanted organs, uh, anything that is foreign to the body, typically your lymphatic system will uh, send up the red flags indicating, hey, something's not right here. Uh, let's get ready to mount an all-out immune attack. Uh, and then also lipid absorption. Uh, and so we find within the lymphatic system a... Uh, a uh, mechanism which allows the transportation of lipids uh, and in, uh, included in that would be your lipid soluble vitamins such as A, D, E, and uh, K. Uh, where does this all take place from? Uh, the lymphatic system will typically absorb uh, these lipid based uh, vitamins or, or lipids in general from within the intestinal tract. Uh, we have not talked about the digestive system yet. Uh, once we are done, uh, once we are done uh, respiratory and urinary, uh, we'll jump into digestive uh, towards the end of the semester. Uh, but we'll get there though, and then you'll understand probably a little bit better about that uh, relationship between the two. Um, some of the structures that are associated with the lymphatic system that we need to make sure. Uh, lymphatic fluid is what we refer to as lymph. Uh, and then we have the lymphatic vessels, which are going to be in charge of transporting uh, that clear fluid within the lymphatic system, again, referred to as lymph. Uh, lymphatic tissue, of course, is going to be made up of uh, cells that are from the macrophage lineages as well as the lymphocytes, uh, you know, a whole wide range of white blood cells, which we have talked about previously. Uh, and, of course, we understand that macrophages uh, are simply a line of cells uh, or a lineage of cells uh, that break down uh, and digest cell particles uh, as well as um, uh, bacteria slash viruses. Uh, so you can kind of understand that when we talk about, and again, that is uh, when, we, when we're defining this. Right, so this definition uh, directly links to uh, what the macrophage is. Uh, and then, of course, lymphatic organs are going to be uh, where these lymphocytes and these macrophages are going to be found. Uh, lymphatic circulation, uh, what we need to understand is that uh, closely linked to, cl uh, crap. 
All right, let me go back here. Um, closely linked to uh, capillaries, blood vessel capillaries, that is, uh, are these lymphatic capillaries. And it, it's almost like it's, a, it's an intermeshing between two types of chain lick fence, if you, if you want to think of it that way. Uh, so you've got your network of blood capillaries that are flowing through and then intertwined into that is going to be your lymphatic capillaries. Uh, those lymphatic capillaries are then going to uh, drain the, uh, the, uh, the lymph or the fluid from within the interstitial fluid found within the tissues, and it's gonna transport that to the lymphatic vessels. Uh, those lymphatic vessels are going to then transfer that lymph to lymph nodes. Uh, this is really the first area along the journey of the lymphatic system where any kind of foreign body detection is going to take place. Um, and then we have, uh, once that lymph has been filtered and cleared, uh, it's going to exit again into the lymphatic trunk uh, and then go to lymphatic ducts. Uh, and then from there, you're going to enter into your various structures and organs. Um, let me just see something here real quick. Uh, yeah, so this picture, and I apologize for these double images. Um, I, I should have separated them, and I didn't. But uh, if we look here, uh, you can see that you have an entrance into the lymph, the lymph node. Uh, all of your filtering is going to take place uh, within these nodules that you see going on right there. The cleared fluid as such is going to collect within the helium uh, and then it will again exit out these efferent vessels down here at the bottom. Uh, so it enters again it's going to enter it's going to filter, and then it's going to exit. And exits, as it exits, that is where you're going to see uh, that lymph fluid going into the lymphatic vessels and the lymphatic ducts, uh, and the lymphatic trunks, I should say. I'm sorry. Um, so lymph nodes, lymph trunk, uh, and then the lymphatic duct is the uh, progression that we're going to see with the fluid. And again, uh, the key point to doing all of this is uh, for the sake of detecting any kind of foreign bodies, uh, whether it's bacterial, whether it's allergen, um, whether it's um, viral, cancer, whatever it is, um, those lymphatic ducts are going to be there to clear everything out. Let's talk a little bit about those lymphatic ducts. Uh, we know that we have uh, two major regions of lymphatic ducts. We have the right lymphatic duct, uh, which is going to drain an area uh, that is relatively uh, small, uh, basically that half of the body. Um, and you can kind of see that whole area there drained in purple. So it's going to drain the right jugular, it's going to drain the, drain the uh, subclavian uh, and the bronchial um, metaspinal uh, regions. Now, it's only going to drain the right side of the brain, essentially, uh, whereas the thoracic duct, located on the other side, is going to drain... Uh, not only that area, but it's also going to drain that area. So it drains about three quarters of the body, um, all in all, when it, when it's all said and done. And then we can even split this uh, right there as well. Uh, and so you can kind of see the difference in the size of the area that it drains. Why that is, um, here's here's what it comes down to. It comes down to this guy right here. 
the Cisterna Kylie. Right, remember uh, from our discussion in uh, lecture that the Cisterna Kylie uh, is a region found approximately right there where that little red dot is. Uh, and it's simply an enlarged lymph node, if you would, found within that abdominal region that drains that drains the lumbar region, uh, drains the abdominal region, drains the legs, and, and it kind of uh, acts as a collecting area and then sends everything up into um, uh, the chest cavity to be continued to be drained by the ducts and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so the the reason why that is so big, uh, that area is so big, that thoracic duct region is so large, is because of the Saturna chile. Uh, it drains a majority of the lower half of the body, if not all of the lower half of the body. Uh, and so that's that's the disproportionate uh, regions that you see going on there. Again, it all goes back to the Saturna chile. Some of these you have already become familiar with. Some of them are going to be new to you. Um, but these are the cells that you're going to need to become aware of. We're going to talk more about these uh, as well as some others um, as we go along. Uh, we have natural killer cells, uh, which are going to do exactly what their body sounds like they're going to do. Uh, they are cells within the body that are programmed to kill, destroy, attack, annihilate uh, any kind of foreign body, whether it's bacteria, whether it's an infected cell, maybe with influenza, whether it's a cancer cell, whether it's a, transplant, a cell from a transplanted body organ uh, or body part, whatever it is, uh, these natural killers are designed to attack and destroy. Uh, and that's the bottom line with them. They are very effective at what they do. Uh, there is a host of means, by the way, by which they will uh, do that, uh, and uh, we'll look at that in a little bit. Um, associated with uh, the thymus, of course, we have T cells, and associated with bone marrow, we have B cells. We will discuss again this a little bit later uh, in our overall discussion of uh, the lymphatic system. Macrophages, uh, again, we have been down this road uh, numerous times with macrophages, um, cells that are going to break down, engulf, uh, phagocytize, uh, rid the body of any kind of debris, any kind of dead cells, any kind of infected cells, uh, anything like that. Um, once that macrophage has got the ID or the license plate number of a bacteria, uh, it's going to go after and attack it, and it's going to its job is to get rid of it. That's that's it. Um, but it is such a key participant throughout this whole system. And then we have the dendritic cells, uh, which again we know are found uh, among other places uh, within the skin, uh, specifically the uh, the upper dermis. Uh, we know that it is also found within the mucous membranes uh, and lymphatic organs. Uh, and their job is basically an early warning detection system, if you would, for the immune system. Uh, as soon as a foreign body is going to enter into the body, those dendritic cells are going to become active and alert uh, the appropriate authorities, if you would, whether it's a macrophage, whether it's a T-cell, whether it's a natural killer, um, of that invader so that they can mount the appropriate retack. Uh, or response, I should say, to the presence of those cells. Where's all of this taking place at? That's a very good question. Uh, we've got two key areas that we need to be concerned with. Um, and again, each of these areas are going to have numerous structures associated with them. Uh, we have primary lymphatic organs and we have secondary lymphatic organs. Uh, your primary lymphatic organs are going to be where your immune cells are produced. Um, basically, you're dealing with undifferentiated stem cells uh, that become, uh, through multiple successive divisions, uh, a lineage 
of cells that will develop eventually into your immune cells. Uh, we've been through this with red bone marrow. Um, we know that we have the uh, pluripotent cells found within um, red bone marrow that become a whole host of things. When we discussed this in chapter, what was it, chapter 19 or something like that, uh, we were concerned with the production of red blood cells. Here, we're concerned with those pluripotent cells becoming uh, the appropriate immune cell. In this case, it would be B cells. Uh, and then, of course, thymus would be uh, producing um, T cells. I will also mention that uh, those pluripotent cells will also uh, sometimes create T cells. Uh, and they create immature T cells, and the, those T cells will then leave the red bone marrow, go to the thymus, uh, where they basically experience a little T cell boot camp. Uh, and uh, those that can uh, hack it and, and make it become mature T cells, and then they are kind of uh, kept separate until they are needed as for a immune response. So the red bone marrow will produce B cells uh, and immature or pre-T cells. Uh, which will later differentiate and, and leave uh, the red bone marrow into the thymus where they would be, uh, become uh, mature T cells, fully functioning for the immune system. Uh, secondary lymphatic organs, uh, where we basically see uh, either early detection of any kind of uh, foreign bodies or we see a all-out uh, immune attack, uh, will occur within the lymph nodes, the spleens, the lymphatic nodules, um, which is the same thing as lymph nodes. I don't know why I have that twice. Uh, at any rate, and then uh, tonsils as well. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the thymus. Uh, we know that we have uh, two structures, and I don't know if we looked at this in lab or not, um, or if we will look at this in lab or not, but just so that you know, uh, within the outer cortex, uh, you're going to have your, pardon me, uh, you're going to have your T cells, both premature and mature T cells. Uh, you're going to have your dendritic cells. Again, we find these within the epidermis, uh, and we also now here find them in the outer cortex of the thymus. Um, we're going to find the uh, Endothelial cells, uh, specifically endothelial is just a type of epithelial cell that's going to form a blood thymus barrier. Now, think about this. Uh, and this was one of those things that I wanted to make sure that we drive home uh, within, uh, within lecture. The reason why you want a blood thymus barrier is because blood has antigens on them. Uh, and the last thing that you want to have happen is have T cells, which have not been programmed for attack, to all of a sudden become um, tainted, if you would, with antigens found within the circulatory system, found within the, the red blood cells. Uh, and so the epithelial cells... Uh, basically prevents blood from really entering into that outer cortex, but does allow for the uh, exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide and nutrients and waste and, and all that kind of good stuff. So that's, that is uh, key. Um, in that sense, um, the epithelial cells as well as the dendritic cells are really aiding in the, in the T cell maturation. Uh, or the maturing of those cells. Um, should also uh, mention that typically uh, T cells, uh, only about 2% of them, will actually reach um, active state. And I will, I will say that again for you. Uh, typically, it is only about 2% uh, of T cells 
that reach an active state. Uh, in other words, it's only about 2% of them that actually ever become mature. All right. And so that's that's something to, to say. I mean, it's only the best uh, that will survive and go on. Uh, what happens to the other 98% of them? Uh, the other 98% of them simply don't make the cut and they go through uh, a process known as apoptosis, um, which is basically programmed cell death. That's what we're dealing with when we talk about apoptosis. Uh, we're talking about um, programmed cell death. Okay, so we're talking about programmed cell death. And again, that would be apoptosis. All right, programmed cell death. Uh, and then, of course, there's some macrophages in there. If you're going to have 98% of your T cells not survive and out of the uh, out of the cortex, you're going to have a lot of carnage laying around that medulla. Uh, I'm sorry, laying around that cortex. Uh, and so you're going to need a large amount of macrophages there to go ahead and rid the outer cortex of the uh, of the uh, the T cells that have not made it um, within the medulla. The 2% will go ahead and leave and enter into uh, the medulla. Um, when they leave, uh, the T cells will typically use uh, the cardiovascular system, the vessels, blood vessels, uh, to go ahead and reach the intended lymphatic structure or, or uh, tissue wherever the immune response is needed. Um, the other thing that we see within the medulla is Hassel's uh, corpuscles. Corp uh, Hassel's corpor corpuscles uh, is simply an area where uh, T cells that have gone on, so we have mature T cells, for whatever reason they're not used, uh, they get old after a week or so and they end up dying. Uh, those T cells will tend to uh, drift and be collected, if you would, in uh, Hassel's corpuscles uh, for um, termination and gotten rid of. Um, but it, you can think of it as a graveyard for T cells. Uh, lymph nodes. Uh, again, we've talked a little bit about these guys already. Um, we have about 600 of these guys throughout the body. Uh, and again, the whole job is to uh, filter the lymph. Uh, and as it's filtering, it is looking for any kind of unrecognizable bacteria or virus or cell, uh, anything that might uh, suggest that a immune response is needed. Uh, and if there is an immune response that needs to be uh, activated, uh, it will do that through or in conjunction with the B cells and the T cells. Now, again, we have not talked about uh, B cells and, and T cells yet. We will. Uh, we'll get to that in lecture. Don't you worry about that. Um, but we just haven't quite gotten there yet. And last but not least, at least for this session, uh, we have our tonsils. Uh, and the tonsils are there to uh, set up a barrier for both the oral cavity as well as the nasal passages. Uh, and so you're going to find your tonsils um, located in areas that are going to be easily accessible to monitor uh, what you're breathing in through your nose uh, as well as what you're ingesting through the mouth. And if for some reason there is any kind of uh, bacteria or virus or foreign body that, that uh, the, uh, the, the tissue or the cells deem to be uh, harmful, it will go ahead and initiate a immune response, uh, again, relying on those B cells and uh, T cells. 
Uh, we do have three sets of tonsils. We have the uh, pharyngeal, uh, which is typically what we would call the adenoids. We have palatine tonsils, uh, which are going to be located uh, right in the upper roof of the mouth. And then we have the um, uh, lingual tonsils, which is going to be down underneath of the tongue. Uh, and so they are the three sets of tonsils that we uh, that we have. Um, with that, uh, I'm going to let you kind of digest this, chew this over a little bit, uh, review it, make sure that you understand it. Uh, this is more structure-based here. Uh, during the next Wimba session, and, and again on the third Wimba session for this chapter, uh, we will be getting into a lot more of exactly how does the body uh, mount a defense, and, and who are the really the key players, and what kind of a defense can we mount uh, against invaders, um, such as, again, bacteria and viruses and, and foreign cells and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so, uh, as always, happy studying. Uh, if you have any questions, any questions at all, please feel free to uh, shoot me an email or, again, jot them down on paper and uh, bring them to class next time we meet. Uh, and I'll be more than happy to start class off with a, a review of your questions. Um, so uh, for now, uh, this is Professor Young uh, saying uh, catch you later and uh, happy studying. And if you need anything, as always, shoot me an email.